Cool. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back to the Fantasy Network. I am, of course, Jimmy Nuts, and today I am beyond thrilled to say that we're going to be reviewing the Farseer Trilogy by Robin Hobb. It has been an absolute uh, blast to read this series, and I actually had to take about a week or two just to kind of settle down because I wanted recency bias to settle, and I really wanted to sit on it and think about it and calm down because this took me by storm. If you haven't read Farseer yet, uh, this is going to be no spoilers. I am going to go over each book and then try to give my overall thoughts of just Robin Hobb and the first time I've read her and also the Farseer trilogy as a whole. I'll try to keep it somewhat short. <laughs> and to say why I read Robin Hobb, uh, there, there's a lot of people who have recommended it to me, but Chris Bookish Cauldron was absolutely an endorser of Robin Hobb from the get-go. He said, hey, you like Gurm? You're probably going to like Robin Hobb. And Gurm is also a huge fan of Robin Hobb. So this was a no-brainer. You know, I did make this channel because I love A Song of Ice and Fire and I wanted to find more fantasy series like that and that was part of this journey that I wanted to share with all of you and I have to say I think out of everything I've read there's been stuff that's gotten close but to capture that same obsession feeling that I have with the Song of Ice and Fire I don't know if anything has come as close as Farseer did and now I'm going to be reading all of Realm of the Elderlings I'm going to hold off on that judgment but I just would like to say I have hope that this could be something that might even you know, be able to contend with A Song of Ice and Fire as my favorite series of all time. But that, that remains to be seen. I'm not sure. Today we're just going to talk about Farseer, and i got to remember to keep this in scope because there's so much to say about Robin Hobb because she does so many things well, and Farseer is an amazing trilogy, one of my very favorites uh, whenever we're talking about the entire fantasy genre. I mean, we're basically following around a royal bastard named Fitz, and Fitz is <laughs> living not the life, a life. I wouldn't say it's very good. Uh, it's definitely a bit of a downer at first and through several points of the series. But Fitz is brought to Buck Keep. Uh, his father was a prince and now he's been kind of excommunicated from the castle. He's given up his right to the throne because he had a bastard. And now Fitz is just kind of existing here at Buck Keep Castle. He's surrounded with a cast of characters that range from wonderful to terrible to I'm not sure how to feel about them. But every single character feels so distinct and stands out. And that's one of the main things that I noticed immediately about Assassin's Apprentice is that everyone had a very unique feel. Even from the way that they talk to each other, from the way that they do their tasks throughout their daily life. I mean, this is absolutely a bit of a slice of life, at least in Assassin's Apprentice. It felt like a slice of life. It kind of felt like Goblin's Emperor... Uh, in, a, in a way. Uh, it, they're totally different and it's not just a slice of life novel, but it did have that element to it. Yeah, even through just like everyday tasks or going down to Buckkeep Town or whatever, uh, everything just felt very alive and unique. Some of it very dreary and some of it kind of sad and depressing and bleak. Like it was almost like a gray film over Assassin's Apprentice when I first started it, but I liked it and it felt unique. So starting with Assassin's Apprentice, again, we're getting introduced to Fitz and the world and everything. And Robin Hobb is a wonderful writer. I just want to say off the bat, I think probably Tide, maybe. And I, we'll see after I read her later work, too. I need to give both of these authors more of a chance and, and read all their stuff. But Tad Williams and Robin Hobb, for me, are probably tied for the best writers that I've read. Robin Hobb writes so elegantly, but also... And I think this is like one of the big separations between authors who do have very nice prose is that sometimes it's not digestible. With Robin Hobb, everything is digestible. And I feel like all the way down to the individual word choice, there's no throwaway sentences with this series. Everything feels like it was very specifically crafted. And a really good example of Hobb's writing is she introduces a character called Patience. And instead of just telling us, oh, Patience wore a long dress and hair, it had hair down to her, you know, her mid back or something like that. She actually describes patience and gives her characterization by describing her room and how cluttered it is and how messy and how her maid's rushing to pick things up and straighten things up. That is just like, it's not the first time it's ever been done, but it's something that you don't see very often. And it's a unique take and it gets away from our typical, you know, the dress was blue and her hair was brown or whatever. And it's those little things where she takes time to craft the characters and give you them through a different scope that I just eat up. And the writing just feels smooth. Uh, when I when I opened up Assassin's, it just felt smooth. And it's like a medieval setting, but it's not overburdened, uh, you know, with the royal people saying we and such. Like, it's a good balance of medieval language, but also not being too much where it kind of takes away from the experience if you're not super into that. Uh, and you know, another, another great example, and I love this, and I saw someone else uh, point this out, and I was excited that I wasn't the only person to see this, but in Assassin's Apprentice, there's basically someone talking to Fitz. I'm not going to give anything away, but 
he's talking about the nature of bastards or something to do with bastards and Fitz is a bastard and the character speaking to him we don't know much about him but he says you know we bastards have to do such and such and Fitz who we're seeing this through which it's a first person perspective which I've never been huge on but this has totally changed that for me because we're experiencing this conversation through Fitz's lens right we're experiencing it as Fitz and Fitz is a kid and Fitz is very frustrating some people say Fitz is dumb he makes some dumb decisions that's true didn't we all when we were that age but Fitz doesn't pick up on the fact that this person said we bastards alluding to the fact that that character is also a bastard we didn't know about this before and it's kind of important uh, I wouldn't say it's like world shattering but it's an important piece of information and Fitz just misses it and then a couple chapters later uh, that character kind of says hey you know I'm a bastard you know that right and Fitz is just like wait what you're a bastard and it's so cool that as a reader we get to kind of pull that that context out if you're paying attention and you have knowledge that our protagonist who is a first person perspective doesn't have that's so small and so just ah this little things about Robin Hobbs writing that make her just five stars in my opinion and speaking of the first person perspective uh, I want to say if you are not a fan of that, I think you should still give uh, Assassin's Apprentice a shot because, and Farseer as a whole trilogy, obviously, a shot because this has sold me that I need to read more first-person perspective stuff, absolutely. And part of that reason is that the world building is so subtle, and we are in Buckkeep largely uh, throughout book one, and we're seeing everything through Fitz's eyes. So the world building around Fitz is, is a young guy he's really been to Buckkeep in one other place so all the world building happens through town chatter gossip stuff he hears in the kitchens so we are getting <laughs> the information and misinformation about what's going on in the world and that builds out a world that isn't really a reliable uh, narrative right like we don't know that the resources are reliable so we're constantly guessing and being able to theorize and even here in book one I felt like I was able to craft theories and then get to disprove or approve them later on which is just a fun experience as a reader you know and as I finished Assassin's Apprentice I was like how am I gonna sell this to people because it's not some grandioso adventure for straight off the back I mean you're you're really with a coming of age boy through the, like the damnedest times and also through some of the most mundane times I loved reading about Fitz like shoveling horse manure or doing his chores I would be sitting on the couch watch TV I kind of turn off and be like I wonder what Fitz is up to and I just flip open Assassin's Apprentice so it, this was a hard one for me to really relay how just absolutely of a joy this was to read and the cool balance is is that because we do mundane tax and all, all these things the magic when it happens is very very intriguing and we want to know more I mean it's kind of like when something big happens in a small town and you don't have a lot going on uh, everyone's talking about it, everyone's obsessing about it so whenever we see something fantastical happen in the series it's a big deal so just based on Assassin's Apprentice is where we're at now with this review uh, Hob has just absolutely encapsulated my attention and I think that she's managed to accomplish here or what she's managed to accomplish here is to create an encompassing immersive story through one of the best characters that I have ever read um, again at least just based on this first book so I wrap up book one I'm immediately in the book two I'm ready just to hear Fitz doing anything <laughs> I don't care if it's him putting away his socks or building a fire I just I am kind of in you know I'm sold I'm immersed in the story but I didn't get just the same stuff and it's really interesting because I think the books are appropriately named and they're like different type of books so really Assassin's Apprentice really is about him being an apprentice and doing apprentice type things and it just happens to be so well written and so well realized that it's interesting with book two Royal Assassin the focus is on Royal because Fitz begins to learn about politics and playing the, these court games with these lords and you know speaking out both sides of your mouth and all that good stuff and it's it's an intriguing intriguing entry into the series to say the least and also in book two and I don't say this lightly because I have a lot of annual animal companionship uh, that I love from other series the this has the best animal companionship of all time bar none I mean it's like whenever Michael Jordan played basketball and number two is Shaq and you're like oh man Shaq's really good but Michael Jordan's like so much better that is Robin Hobb when it comes to animal companionship bar none and while like I said we're still getting all of the political intrigue and all these really cool you know court politics 
there's still a big mystery around the Red Raiders, and we're exploring that, and we're getting more world building, and our cast uh, is is widening a bit, but we're just getting more intimate with those characters as Fitz grows those relationships. It all feels very organic here. And that's one of the things that happens to get me super engrossed in books. And if you hate Fitz, like I know some people do, it doesn't even matter because, you know, Beerich, uh, the Fool, Ketrickin, Ketrickin's a badass. The Fool is probably my favorite character outside of Fitz. There's something uh, for everyone here, and I think you can kind of get behind a camp and try to figure out their motivations. And the characters themselves get much more fleshed out. Like the supporting cast gets mu much more fleshed out here in book two. And there's also a theme, and again, this is no spoilers, and I thought this is a beautiful piece of Robin Hobbs writing. I kind of talked about the wee bastard thing earlier. This is another really subtle thing, but as the book goes on and Fitz gets in more and more trouble and becomes more and more secluded into himself, uh, he, you know, he starts putting locks on his door, and at first it's just a lock, and then it's two locks and a bolt, and then it's boards, and it's, it's a very subtle thing, and maybe I'm picking at nothing here, but I felt the more of internal conflict and secluded Fitz got, and the more danger he got in, the more his door was being boarded up in his room. Uh, and that might be an obvious, like, well, he's in more danger, of course he's going to do more locking, but it's also like a subtle nod and imagery to the fact that he's becoming more and more lost in himself and more and more secluded and kind of selfish. I thought that was a nice touch. Maybe I'm barking at nothing. If you notice that, I'd love to know about it uh, down in the comments if you think I'm onto something there because I really felt like that stood out for a reason. You know, we kind of talked about the gossip in book one and how that's how Fitz is learning the world, but he's getting a little older now. He's getting to tell who's kind of crazy and who's uh, into conspiracies and who's not reliable and also how to manipulate people based on what they will believe, what they're willing to believe as truth. And the final chapters of this book are some of the most armchair gripping moments I've ever had. I had to fight back tears uh, more than once, and I had to hold back some shouts of excitement. It hit on pretty much every emotional beat imaginable for me. You know, it's not a blockbuster type ending, but it's definitely one that hits home and cashes in on the emotional connection that has been grown throughout the first two books. Irrefutable changes have happened to the friends in the series of Fitz, and they can't be undone. There's weight to this ending. There's weight to this story. It's intense, and the passion is just brilliant. Royal Assassin, without a doubt, has one of, if not, I would say it's in the top three best endings to a book I've ever read. Some people may look at what happens at the end of RA and say, oh, well, that's cheap. I would absolutely bring you on and debate you. I think that there is abs there's consequences and there's repercussions for what happens at the end of Royal Assassin once you jump into book three. And it's because of that that nothing comes for free in Robin Hobb's books. The fact that there are, you know, there's magical things happening. Uh, Fitz is kind of on a bit of a hero's journey or a noble journey where he thinks he's making the right choices and every little piece ends up having a consequence for good or for worse and maybe he thinks he's making the best decisions but sometimes he finds out that even the best decisions have repercussions and that is no different from the climax of book two and how it leads into book three. I do stand by it. I think that Royal Assassin has one of the best endings and it's one of my favorite books I have ever read. As of right now, I feel like it is the second best book I've ever read, and that's just Royal Assassin by itself. I mean, I, I love Farseer as the whole trilogy, and we're about to talk about book three, but book two specifically, I had to just say, um, had a little bit of everything. It had some romance, which I'm not a huge fan of. I thought it was executed perfectly for the age group, and some people might get annoyed by it, but that's kind of the purpose. Like, we're not here to play to fantasy tropes. We're not here to... Uh, you know, do your run of the mill fan, everyone feels good. No, like there are consequences for being selfish. There's consequences for accepting duty and responsibility. And it just felt so impactful to me, so real and so heavy. It was, uh, I mean, it's a 10 out of 10 book for me. Absolutely. Now, if Royal Assassin was a book about learning court politics and the consequences of your actions in those court politics, I would say that uh, Assassin's Quest is exactly what it says. It's the quest. We finally get a lot more of the world. Now, we had went to other places with Fitz, but this is really the time where we kind of actually move out of Upkeep permanently, and we're, we're on a quest. And I like that a lot, and I think it got to kind of expand on Robin Hobb's strengths and her writing and be able to kind of flex some different uh, literary muscles, if you will. And the book starts off so 
well. And part of the reason why book three has one of the strongest beginnings of any book I've read is because of what happens at the end of book two and that there are consequences for what happens at the end of book two. And being on this quest, it's just a nice change of pace to see fits in some different environments. Robin Hobb's ability to introduce a character naturally and then also lead into their motivations without being super uh, exposition-y about it is amazing. Also love the epigraphs at the beginning uh, they kind of give us a lot of world building and some refreshers also in book two and three. I really appreciated that because there's a lot of detail in this series. And all throughout this, there's always been an expectation of what Fish should be or what he is, right? He's a royal bastard. So it's really interesting that here in the third book, we get to see Fitz interacting with people who have absolutely no expectation of him, have no idea who, uh, you know, who he belongs to or what his role should be in society. And it brings out a different side of Fitz that we hadn't seen before, which is very interesting considering that we're in his head constantly throughout these books. And also a lot of what we saw with the mat, the magic system could have been picked better because we got to see other perspectives and we got a little bit of knowledge of things going around the world through the magic system. So Robin Hobb definitely carefully picked her magic system and the rules behind it. And it's really, it's really fun to see the fact that some of the things are being validated that we saw happening far away uh, through the magic system. And the animal companionship even improves here again, which is amazing because it was already 10 out of 10 in book two. But I like the fact that the wit, uh, and you, you'll figure out what that is. I like the fact that the wit doesn't just affect the human, but it also affects the animal companion. Uh, and that's something that I have never seen in any other annual animal, the warging, whatever. If you can talk to animals, it always feels like it's always about the person. It's always about how it affects them. Unless if it's just, you know, a bottom, bottom of the barrel affection storyline where you can tell the animal loves the person, yada, yada, yada. But it actually has like repercussions and it changes the animal. The animal is, you know, night eyes, for, yeah, I'll say his name, night eyes is one of the best characters. I mean, he can be your favorite character because he undergoes changes and has motivations. And from Night Eyes to Fitz, I mean, this whole this whole cast gets a lot more complex here. And you see the irrefutable changes. Some of them are hard to swallow. Some of it's very hard to swallow because you loved who that person was and now they are just changed forever because of uh, consequences. Nothing is for free here, nothing at all. And uh, it, it's bittersweet at some points. It's, it can also be deliciously aggravating. Deliciously aggravating. That's how I would describe Farseer Trilogy and Fitz as a whole is uh, you, you want to punch him in the face, but then you also kind of want to give him a hug and keep, you know, keep hearing his story at the end of it. And at the end of book three, I, I, the ending was different. Um, and, I, you know, I guess I'll just get into my cons. The cons are is that I didn't feel the scale. I didn't... I knew of the world conflict and of the different places that were featured here, but... At some points, especially in book three, I didn't feel the scale of the world and I didn't feel the conflict as much and how important it was because it's such an interpersonal uh, narrative and story that does have bigger repercussions and all that stuff. For something that's happening that, you know, it seems like the world could end for these people, I never felt that dire need to figure things out. I felt on a personal level. I felt like, oh, Fitz is in trouble or this other character is in dire you know, need of help. But I never felt like the stakes were high for the world. And that's partially because things aren't being explained 100% to us yet. And that's why there are, what, 16 books in Realm of the Elderlings? So I know I'm going to get that later. But just as a Farseer as a trilogy... I didn't feel the scale of the world and the conflict as much as I had hoped. And with that, I did think, so if I had to rate these books, it'd be book two, book one, book three. And book three was a suitable ending, but it really started leaning into more of the magic. And I feel like it is clouded in a bit of mystery on purpose uh, because those fantastical elements are going to be explored through other series here in, in the realm of the Outerlings, the other trilogies and so on. But it kind of felt like a weird fever dream. And I read this with some people in um, Rid's Discord server. They happened to be reading the same time as me and we were talking. And I felt like a lot of them felt like that as well. They felt that it was just kind of weird. Like it, you didn't know what was reality and what was happening. And there's Fitz is going through um, Fitz, <laughs> no pun intended. But, you know, he's going through a lot of stuff. And then you can't tell if you're in a Fitz fever dream or, or what you're seeing is reality. And that's tough. And it's not bad. It's just different. And it's weird. And it, it did land with me. I liked the ending. I thought, you know, I felt my heart picking up during uh, the climax. 
but I thought that the court politics that I was used to in book two were a little bit more intriguing, and I think the climax of book two is going to be very hard to beat going forward for any book at all. The trilogy does have a very um, solidified ending. I think she delivers on it, and I'm going to be reading on. But if you wanted to stop at this trilogy, you absolutely could. I think the ending, there, there's a lot of mystery still, but it's tied up nicely, and I kind of felt at peace. And it's strange because I was just saying, like, as soon as I read it, I said, well, this is the year of the realm, realm of the Elderlings. As soon as I closed Royal Assassin, I said, I'm reading all of Hob this year, <laughs> at least Realm of the Elder, Elderlings. Uh, and it's just completely wrecked my TBR. But when I finished the Farseer trilogy, I was satisfied. I felt like I just read one of the best trilogies I've ever read. I want to get to all Realm of the Elderlings, but I did not feel like I had to jump in the live ship knowing that Fitz wasn't in it. That's not a negative. I'm just telling you how I felt. Uh, and I am jumping right into the live ship. Uh, after I read a couple more things this month, uh, towards the mid or end of March, I will be reading live ship. And I am going to read all of Realm of the Elderlings this year. I think that will be the last big series I do before Malazan. And I just want to say that even though the conflict isn't, uh, it is epic, but I didn't feel it on an epic scale. And even though I felt like the world was a bit secluded, I liked that. I liked the personal experience that I had with Fitz as a character. I'll be honest, I'm getting a little bit older and I'm starting to realize how stupid I was uh, as a kid and how uh, ignorant I could be and how I didn't realize how my choices affected other people. And that's part of growing as a person. And we get to see Fitz do that in real time. So maybe I have a bit more patience with Fitz than other people who find him to be a dumb dumb. But I see some of it uh, I see myself in. And I also see some things I didn't do, right? But I can understand the humanity of it. And Fitz is, without a doubt, one of the best realized characters that I've ever read. I think Robin Hobb's one of the best authors I have ever read. Uh, and I should have said this at the beginning of the review. If you think, if you read Assassin's and you thought it was boring... Uh, I actually do think book two is worth giving a try if you didn't like book one or if you just thought it was okay. I think book two is a pretty good point. If you didn't like book two, you could probably stop. Um, and I can't say that for all the other Realm of the Underlings, but specifically for Farseer is what we're talking about here today. Um, I think if, you don't, if you're not sold by book two, you could probably turn it, turn it off. You're good. Um, but if you find this boring, I'm sorry. I, I, I've seen some people say, ah, oh, you know what, Assassin's Apprentice, Farseer, it's boring. I'm sorry that you feel that way. I don't feel that way at all. Uh, I'm sure there'll be people who comment on this video and say, yeah, it's boring as hell. You know, there are mundane tasks and the pacing could be slow at some times, but I always felt like there was something going on, whether it was uh, ability to start theory crafting because of a little piece of information we got in dialogue or something else. I always felt like there was something going on, whether it's in my brain or in the narrative. I did not feel like the pacing was very bad. In fact, I kind of wish that sometimes the books were longer because we skipped over some like there were some off-page character moments and relationship building that I would have loved this scene, but I understand why it was cut. Um, so if anything, I could have enjoyed the books if they were a little bit longer. Uh, but I didn't find this boring at all, um, and that criticism kind of blows me away. I mean, there are some books that just aren't for people, but I could never be bored uh, reading this, and I never was. In fact, I think it was one of the most addicting reads I've ever had. I got through the entire series in like a week, I think. I, I don't know if I've ever read a a lengthier series like this ever this fast. I mean, I love Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, and I did not even come close to reading it this fast. I think since A Song of Ice and Fire and maybe The Faithful and the Fallen, Robin Hobb's Farseer trilogy is the most enthralling, addictive read I have had uh, in my life. And even now as I record this, I just, uh, I feel like I'm doing a disservice to the trilogy because I, I'm having a lot of trouble and I've actually said this to some of my friends. I just feel bad because I don't feel like I can relay how much I truly love this series. Because when I tell you it's through a first-person perspective, a royal bastard who happens to make some bad decisions and can be internally frustrating. Uh, and it does a lot of mundane tasks and a slice of life, a tight piece, at least in the first book. Uh, it's just hard to pitch it. And it's hard to say, yeah, this is like one of the best series I've ever read. <laughs> but uh, you just got to take my word for it. You're going to have to give it a shot. And if you have tried and you didn't like it, I'm sorry. Uh, but this is absolute five out of five for me. One of the best trilogies I've ever read. I think Realm of the Elderlings has the potential to be the best series I've ever read, uh, which if you know how much I love A Song of Ice and Fire, uh, that's saying a lot. Now, I'm not saying that's the case now, but I'm saying we'll see what happens, okay? I'm excited for Realm of the Elderlings. So there's going to be a ton more content here on the channel because I'm going to read all of the series within this and I'm going to be reviewing them all. I'm in fact thinking about doing a Farseer spoiler discussion, maybe having Chris or Red on the channel to do that. If you're interested in that, please let me know because I, I wanna do these live streams, but I, I 
would like to know the interest level before. So if you would like to see a spoiler discussion about Farseer and hear my thoughts in a live stream, if you'd like that, please go down below and let me know in the comments. I would really appreciate that. And if you like this video, hit like and subscribe and turn on the bell for notifications because there's more Realm of the Outer Links coming and Robin Hobb is now a staple. You might as well just call this the Fantasy Network featuring Robin Hobb because uh, her writing is just delicious. I mean, it's beautiful and it's, it's elegant and it's smooth. It's just so smooth. And I hear she just gets better. So that's ridiculous. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for spending your time with me. I'm sorry if this came across ranty. I try to make points for each book. And just overall, I think that uh, the Farseer trilogy is a masterpiece, and I think it encapsulates character work uh, with subtle world building that leaves you in a story that you just can't put down. So thank you for putting up with my ranting, and I hope that you enjoy if you pick it up, and if you do, let me know. Um, but until next time, I see you. I hope you're good. I hope you're safe. And remember to always keep turning the page. Mm -hmm.